That feels fantastic. Okay, so I always like the introduction because it kind of tells you a little bit about who you are, but I just want to tell you a little bit more about who I am, that the stuff that doesn't show up in the introduction. And I want to start out by saying a couple of caveats. One, I am on sabbatical and I am living my best life right now. And I'm talking about the book. So I'm excited and I start talking fast. If I start talking too fast, I need for you to pull your ear and I will possibly slow down. <laughs> but I've been doing this for 49 years. I was born August 3rd, 1973. I was talking to uh, Kate and Brandon at dinner last night. I'm going to use profanity for illustration purposes. <laughs> and one of, my, one of my dearest girlfriends told me, once you turn 50, you give zero fucks. I am 49 and I'll be 50 in August and I still give zero fucks. So I don't know what 50 is going to look like. So I stopped saying that I talk fast. I'm not taking all of that. Y'all got to own some of that. Y'all might listen a little slowly. But y'all listen a little faster, I've slowed down. We might just be on the same page. I thank you for the faculty that are in here today. This conversation really is not for you. It really is for my graduate students. I'll be the, and I said my, because my graduate students span beyond just the University of Maryland. Everywhere I go, I say once a graduate, once a student of Dr. Marsha is always a student of Dr. Martha. So I kind of want, I want you to think you're in the throes of like doing some of your research, trying to figure out what your, what your research is going to be about, how it's going to matter and all that type of great stuff. I want to give you a little trajectory and a little um, timeline on how I got to the book. I'm not going to give you all the golden nuggets in the book because I want everybody to buy the book. So if I sit up here and give you 45 slides in the book, you're not going to buy the book. But more importantly, I want to speak to my graduate students. I want to talk to you about like how, you, how your research can matter. Think about your trajectory. So I'm going to take you on like a little journey on my trajectory, what I've done over the last couple of years. So I will talk fast. Slow me down if you need to. And um, I think it's going to be an interesting kind of conversation. And again, I am on sabbatical. So, it's so happy to be, I'm so happy to be here to talk to you about the book. I've talked to non-academic, well, I've talked to audiences that have some academics. This is my first talk actually at an institution with the book being out. So I'm so excited to have a conversation and see what y'all think about uh, the book. So I like to start out with audience participation. So you, while you're eating, keep this, cook, this aside, raise, raise your hand with me. So raise your hand if you know somebody that's single. Now just go with me for a second. Raise your hand if you know somebody that's single. Raise your hand if you know somebody that's single and living alone. Raise your hand if you know somebody that's single, living alone, and college educated. Raise your hand if you know somebody that's single, living alone, college educated, makes good money. I know I got demographers in the room. Just go with me for a second. <laughs> like, what does that mean, Dr. Marsh? I'm like, okay. Raise your hand if you know somebody that's single, living alone, college educated, making good money, and is working. And lastly, all that and a homeowner. So a lot of hands, if not, if not, you could you could also nominate yourself. You could also raise your hand. What's interesting about this is that there's this demographic group that's growing that falls into some of these categories. And so as I, I as a, to my graduate, to my graduate students again. So some of y'all are have, have y'all taken off your qualifying exams or anything? You're getting ready to study, you're studying for those or yeah, yeah. So I, I failed mine. I failed my first ones. I think that's really important to say. And my, my SAT score wasn't really all that high either. But I don't think, or my GRE scores. I don't know, a lot of faculty may not may not necessarily say that, but I want to let you know I failed my um in qualified exams, I now have a book with Cambridge University Press. So if you get some little hiccups along the way, please understand you can get back on track and you continue going forward. So one of the things that was important to me as a scholar, though, I decided early on in my scholarship that, and I'm so mad that this is being recorded, so I gotta, I gotta, I gotta tailor some of the things I would normally say, <laughs> some of the things I would normally say. So one of the things that was important to me as an academic, and please understand what I mean when I say this, I realized I was not going to pimp the poor to make my academic career. So when I say that, do you know what I mean by that? So what I wanted to do is I wanted to look at other parts of Black America. I understand that there's a Black, there's a black poor population. There's a poor population. There's a Black poor. But there's also a Black middle class. And there's any Bible scholar, the Bible talks about how the poor will be with us for always. So they will be there. But I don't know how many times I've sat in presentation. And the Black coefficient is always statistically significant. It's always highly significant. It's always highly relevant. I was like, I don't want to sit in those presentations like that. I want to look at people who have quote unquote done everything right and get an understanding of like how they're living their lifestyles. So demographers, I think did, uh, there's some demographics here. I think demographers, when I was trying to understand the black middle class in graduate school, I really was interested in segregation patterns. I realized that um, the demographers, the demographic literature wasn't really getting me where I wanted to go. So I was thinking I wanted to do my own kind of research and get to a certain kind of conversation. So in the book, the book, let me, oh, I didn't pull my prop out. I got my prop that I got to pull out with me in the book. 
Um, I'm looking at people that are single and living alone. Solid. It's either single and living alone or single adults living alone. I want to tell you who they are. And I'm so glad I'm talking to like demographers and others because I think this becomes a really interesting kind of conversation. So when I'm talking about people that are single, living alone, I want to tell you exactly who I mean. So I'm looking, I want to tell you about the quantitative work that I did. So I did quantitative work and then you get tenured, right? So I was tenured in 2014. I was the first black female demographer that was tenured at the University of Maryland College Park. It's both a pride and an honor to hold that title, but it's also uh, offensive to hold that title. So I'm from LA. So because I'm from LA, I went to a day to drive and bought myself an overpriced Gucci purse and carry it most places. She only makes appearances three times a year. She didn't, get, she didn't make it to this. <laughs> She's already been out once when the book came out. She came out. But like, this is audacious. I want the audacious purse because it's audacious that I am the first Black female to model. I'm the first Black anything. And if the book goes the way in which I hope that it goes, I'll be the first Black woman who will go from assistant to associate to full at the University of Mary College Park. And I'm not, I'm not hung up on titles, but I want little black and brown girls to see me do that because I'll be the first one to do that. But anyway, so the, a lot of my work focuses on people that are single and living alone. And my quantitative work, I'm going to talk about my quantitative work and tell you how I got to my qualitative work. And some of this stuff was actually started in graduate school. I wanted to look at people that were ages 25 to 54. I picked those age ranges because I wanted people outside of once you graduate from college. We all know being in college. We don't have any class status and we're broke. We, we're eating top ramen and oodles and noodles. We all know that, right? But I also want to look at people who are past, past fertility, um, childbearing age or slightly outside of childbearing age and thinking about retirement. So I wanted to see like, you know, who they were and what they were, what their lifestyles actually were. I wanted people that were single, never married. I get a lot of pushback about this, single, never married. Part of the reason why I was interested in understanding people that were single and never married is because I wanted those who had not been exposed to the stimuli, the stimuli being marriage. There are people that have returned to single because of widowhood, separation, or divorce, but that's not the group that I was studying. Great work for a dissertation, but not the work that I was interested in doing. I wanted those who had never been exposed, especially because later on I'll talk about like wealth and stuff like that. So it becomes really important to look at those that have never married. I also wanted to look at those who may or may not live alone. And this is interesting because what I mean by this in the quantitative work that I did, I wanted people who were not in the house with a romantic partner. You could live with other people, but you were not with a romantic partner. And I also wanted to look at people that were child-free. Terms are changing. We don't use childless anymore. We definitely use child-free. So if you're familiar with any of the social science literature around singlehood, you know that there's like a really great book by Eric Kleinenberg that was called Going So, an extraordinary life of single, single life or something like that. And so I, Chris Marsh, as I'm writing this book, had to decide, as I'm doing my scholarship on the quantitative level, but as I write the book too, I had to decide if I wanted to call the group that I was interested in, who are Black, whether or not I wanted to call them solo, single and living alone, or solo. They actually decided to go with solo. And the reason and I grapple with that, but the reason why I decided to go with Sala as opposed to Solo is to strengthen my argument that I have to understand that race plays a key component in how we think about singlehood. So if I were to put, if I were to call this group Solo, I think it dilutes the conversation about race. And I did not want to dilute the conversation about race. So I decided to call this group Sala. So given that conversation about Sala and Solo, one of the things that I argue in the book, uh, and I think is important, is that Here's the people that have never been married from 25 to 65, um, from 1880 until 2010. I did not break it down by race. And this is one of the only times that I do a racial comparison because most of my work is intra-racial. Again, we start to do these interracial comparisons. Sometimes Blacks um, look like, whites are kind of normalized and Blacks are looking like, like outliers. I don't want to do that kind of scholarship. But if you look at this, and yeah, I'm glad that I'm, I'm in a room with, with, with all of y'all because I don't know what happened in 1950. I don't know what happened. If anybody knows in the Q&A, slide that kind of question in there so you can answer the question and we'll all know what happened. But here's what we do know. We do know that Blacks are dominating the category, especially, past, especially post-1950. One of the things that I'm a little bit concerned about with the scholarship, the singlehood scholarship right now, is that it appears to be taken on a white gaze and a white face. And what it feels like is that a lot of white women are choosing to be single or are single. So now a lot of scholarship is like, oh, let's have a whole, now the scholarship feels like it has a very white gaze or white face. I am here to say that Black women in particular have been doing singlehood, whether by choice or by force, for quite some time. So I don't want scholars to take singlehood and try to make it a white argument and a white conversation without paying respect and homage to Black women. So because of that, that's one of the things I talk about in the book. I want to talk about how these Black women are living their lives, Black, and, Black men and women in the book. 
But before I get there, though, one of the things we have to argue and think about is the Black middle class and if there is this demographic shift in the Black middle class. So most of my quantitative work argues that there is this demographic shift in the Black middle class. Here's what we do know. There's some subtle arguments in the literature that is suggesting, they're subtle, they're, 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 they're implicit. They're suggesting that because we're seeing a decrease in married couple households, we're also seeing a decrease in the Black middle class. And so they're making this kind of heteronormative assumption that the middle class would be married with 2.5 kids and a black picket fence paying homage to Mary Patillo's work on the black middle class. But I offer an alternative view in a social forces article that I published in 07 as a postdoc at UNC Chapel Hill. I'm arguing that we're seeing an increase in single and living alone households because we're seeing an increase in single and living alone households with an in decrease in married couple households used to the black middle class um, increasing and or at a minimum stabilizing itself. So it's an alternative conversation. I think it gets to this sudden, subtle, subtle assumption that you need to be married and have uh, children to be considered middle class. Now, you know, I talk about my work everywhere I go. I'm in the grocery store. I'm like, oh, I do research on the black middle class. And people always ask me, I make $150,000 if I consider it middle class. I'm like, ah, oh, it's not that complicated. But if you take my lecture on Thursday at 12 o'clock, I'll give you a whole entire conversation about the consensus on middle class. Here's what we know, right? There's typically three variables that we use to measure middle class, objective variables. That's education, income, and occupation. In the last 20 or 30 years, you're starting to see an increase in wealth being included in the conversation. I'm drawing from Oliver Shapiro's work, Black Wealth, White Wealth, and how we really want to think about the fragility of the Black middle class, how they might be one or two paychecks away from poverty. So we want to have some kind of like wealth measure. In most of my work, I use um, um, homeownership as a wealth measure. So I'm trying to decide like how actually I want to measure the middle class, graduate student, postdoc, graduate student, sorry, my postdoc. So I looked at some of the variables, um, the four variables that are often used, and I'm like, okay, so let's look at bachelor's degree, blacks versus whites. Let's look at bachelor, and I'm using those for simplicity purposes. I'm going somewhere, so let's go with me for a second. So I looked at the median occupation score for blacks and whites, and then most importantly, I looked at like homeownership rates. This is based like, on 2010 data, but I looked at them some data just last night. The numbers are pretty much the same for Black Americans. In fact, I think it's 41%, so it might be just a little bit of a decrease. So because we see these differences here, the question I had to ask myself as a scholar is whether or not I wanted to make a middle class measure or whether or not I wanted to make a Black middle class measure to argue the demographic shifts in the middle class. Y'all want to know which one I picked, and y'all can y'all tell already which one. <laughs> yes. Well, I decided to make a Black middle class index. And in this Black middle class index, I drew from 1980, 20, 1990, 2000, 2010, and 2014 uh, data synthesis data. I looked at various household types. I didn't only look at married couples and singles. I looked at various household types. I also looked at those 25 to 54. Those are those towards retirement. But I also looked at those 25 to 44 that were slightly outside of the childbearing age. And I did make it race specific because I wanted to know about the black middle class relative to itself. I did not want to know about the black middle class relative to other people. So I developed the black middle class index in the social forces article that I wrote in 07. And there's four variables to, to load on the black middle class index. So I looked at all black households. If you, if anybody in the household had a bachelor's degree, you received a one on the index. I looked at the wealth measure, someone using home ownership as a proxy. If you were owning, if you bought, if you owned or were buying your home, you received a one on the index. I looked at the occupational scores for all black households. I picked the median, I believe. If you're above the median, you received a one on the um, occupational score. Then I calculated a per person income indicator. Part of the reason why I did that is because I was looking at households of the various types to see um, their income status. So I decided to go with an, um, in a per person income indicator as opposed to even like household income or something of that nature. But here's what's interesting. Here's some pushback that I've gotten from this over the years. So I'm Aretha Franklin fan. So let's use the Aretha Franklin example. So let's say we have a young woman named Aretha. Let's say she's making six figures. She's making $150,000. Let's say that she has an MBA. Let's say that she's a marketing executive. And let's say that she does not own her home. I'm not putting a value judgment on home ownership, but I am sensitive to what the literature suggested, the black middle class is fragile because they, they lack um, wealth. So if she does not have a home, she would not show up in my category as middle class, which I think is interesting. And I'm not putting value and judgment on it. And I think like younger folks, because I, I talk about this in the book, 
younger folks saw what um, what happened with the family with the housing crisis, and so they saw what happened to their parents, and some people just don't want to buy homes. But I really want to strongly establish that this group exists. So I use the most I use the strictest standards that I possibly could to develop them in the quantitative literature. So if we use this measure, if we look at um, data from 1980, we see that the Black and class make up just 6% of the population. If we look at it at 2010, it's 12%. So the numbers have increased, but I do think that we need to increase those numbers some. Now, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. here's like a, a figure from a, a graph from my, my 27, my 07 social forces article. There's two things I want to highlight in the graph. One are the white bars and one are the black bars. The white bars are married couple households with children looking from 1980 until 2010. We can see that there is definitely a decrease in married couple of households. And for, 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 for caveat purposes, these are hetero, hetero um, married couples in the earlier data. Yeah, these are all heterosexual couples. Um, so you see that heterosexual couples are less than 50% of the US of the black middle class population in 2000. And so you can see that they're definitely decreasing. But what you also see at the same time, if you look at the black bars, you see that there's an increase in people that are single and living alone. So that tells us that there is like a possibly a demographic shift in the black middle class away from married couples to young black professionals who aren't married and don't have any children. And and if you look at the 20, 2000 data, you can see that married couples make up less than 50% of black middle class households. The reason why I think this really becomes an interesting conversation is because if we think about class status transfer from parent to child, if the second largest household type in the black middle class is single and living alone, how do you transfer your wealth? What does that look like? That's the kind of conversation I wanted to pick up in the book. And I do pick up on the book and buy the book and you can read that conversation. <laughs> But if we look at the love jokes cohort from 1980 to 2010, you can definitely see that there's a there's a trend where there's an upper trend for those that are single and living alone with black middle class. If we juxtapose that with married couple households, you can clearly see that there's a decrease in married couple households and there's an increase with children. And there's an increase in those that are single and living alone, a group that I'm actually calling the Love Jones cohort. I had I was telling some people last night, I had to do a um author meets critic for an economist at Harvard who wrote a book called Career and, Career and Women, I believe. I can't remember the title. You probably, you know, you know what I'm talking about? This fabulous book. Claudia, yes, fabulous book. So one of the things she says, so she starts, I'm, okay, admittedly, so I'm a little nervous. I'm like, ah, I'm a hob, but here, let me make sure I got my stuff together. And I was like, of course, I had to, had to make some kind of indictment about the fact that she talked about how this is about women, but it really was about white women, which is fine. Just name the book, The Career and, 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 yeah. When, a career and white women because black women just weren't there so like here i am the black scholar calling you out about not using race i was like but i'm gonna i'm gonna have to do it because no one else did and then we also had a conversation about family as well but she started out by saying my publisher told me i shouldn't call the groups cohort because my readers aren't going to understand the term so i was like well dang it i got it in my entire title <laughs> I was like, but the kind of scholarship that I like to do, the kind of scholar that I want to be, I want people that aren't necessarily academics to be able to pick up my book, read my book, and use terms like cohort that they may not have used before. But the people often ask, okay, Love Jones cohort, what do you mean by that? So for those that do not, first of all, have you seen the movie Love Jones? Okay. So, okay, okay, okay. Yeah, I've got a lot of work to do. So if we think of the quintessential black middle class family, we often think about the Huxtables on the Cosby show. This is way before Bill Cosby, we didn't get into any of that conversation. <laughs> but then if we think about it, so this is like the quintessential black middle class family or upper black middle class family. There was a demographic that started to emerge in the big screen where you start to see the demographic trend, a shift away from married couples to young black professionals who weren't married and didn't have any children. And that, and what really spearheaded that in the media sense would be the movie Love Jones. Side note, Love Jones was, the 25th anniversary of Love Jones was last year. So I really wanted my book to come out last year. Even if it was December 31st, I'd be like, oh my gosh, my book came out the 25th anniversary of Love Jones. Well, it came out the 26th year and we're just gonna be okay with it being one year after the 25th anniversary. Now, for those of you who do not know what the Love Jones is, I'm going to give you a two minute, uh, two minute trailer of the movie. For those of you that do know Love Jones, you're gonna get a little nostalgic moment and you're in a professional conference and you're watching a little bit of Love Jones. So here we go. <laughs> the really good thing is a little bit when I will give you what's for us not to say. Trying to meet another man and this time you and I should have uh, been together some time to have a drink. Anyway. 
I, I so appreciate that none of you guys are going to acknowledge the fact that that's me recording the trailer. <laughs> <laughs> presentation. I was like, hopefully Steve will give me like a, a really nice version of it and put it, and put it in my presentation. So I've done all the quantitative work. I'm now senior. I want to do stuff that really matters to me. And a side note. So, you know, we I think America, like I was talking to someone just today, and I was saying, you know, America kind of stopped on its axis during COVID. I also would argue that America stopped on its axis during George Floyd. And we had this racial awakening. And uh, we had to have some conversations, had to have some real strict conversations with ourselves. And I wasn't sure if I wanted to stay in academia or not. I decided to stay in academia because um, here, here's my here's my argument. When you buy or not, here's my argument. I trained police officers. Now I'm not going to have a conversation about that because anybody that's talked to me over the last day and a half knows that that won't get my blood pressure up. But I did a police supply training with police officers. And one of the things I think is important for us to think about as scholars is that, yes, policing is highly problematic. And I, and I often say police officers kill black bodies, but I do believe that professors kill black spirits. And if I'm going to stay in academia, I'm going to stay in academia because I want to be there for my students. The only reason why I'm still in academia are for the graduate students that are sitting in the back of the room. I'm not exactly sure why you're back there, but I'm only here for you all. The day I get the day I get annoyed with you all and y'all get on my nerves, I'm going to <laughs> chuck my keys under the door and I am out of here. I don't want to do this anymore. But because I decided to stay in academia and I decided to be here for my students and I love my students, once a Dr. Marsh student, always a Dr. Marsh student. I wanted to make sure that I did research that really mattered and really made, um, and someone said movement. I was like, if we're talking about a singlehood movement, then I'm gonna go ahead and say, yeah, we're in a singlehood movement. I wanted to make sure I did research that mattered. And I think this research, I think has the potential to matter. At a minimum, if it doesn't matter to you, I think it will get you to stop, pause and think. If nothing, if I get you to do nothing more than think based on the quantitative work that I've built and now the qualitative work that I'm talking about, then my work here is done. So I wrote a book called The Black Middle Class. No, I did not. I wrote a book called The Love Jones Cohort, Single and Living Alone, The Black Middle Class. So we're going to go ahead and assume that this is like Valentine's Day. It's like the 14th of the month. We're, we're in February. So it's actually Heart Healthy Month and also Valentine's Day. So I want to tell you a little bit about the book and how the book came to be. I'm going to give you just a little bit of golden nugget about the book. So I really do want you to buy the book and have you come back and talk about the book once the book is actually, um, once you've read the book. Uh, my, my clicker's not working. Click a mouse. Click a mouse. Okay. Okay, click the mouse again. Actually, click it. Okay, there we go. There we go. All right, so let's talk about the theoretical frameworks that, that kind of like uh, undergird this book. So I'm drawing from stratification economics. And um, what I appreciate about stratification economics is that it offers a structural conversation more so than an individual conversation. So I kind of draw from that. And one of the arguments that I make in the book is that structural forces constrain personal choices for Black Americans, especially people that are single. Again, structural forces constrain personal choices. Put differently, racism and gender racism constrain personal choices. If I want, if I, Chris Marsh, want to marry a man who is Black, 
and has a bachelor's degree. My, my um, choices are constrained. A PhD, my choices are constrained. A PhD that makes six figures, my choices are constrained. A PhD that makes six figures and owns a home, my choices are constrained. A PhD who owns six figures, owns his own, has his own home and has estate planning, my choices are constrained. So I think what happens a lot of times is that people often leave the conversation at the individual level about singlehood, but and not saying us, but there's a larger conversation. But I'm trying to overlay a structural conversation on singlehood. The other thing I'm trying to do is I'm drawing from intersectionality. I was talking last night and I, when, I, when the book was, we were in the copy editing stage, editing stage. And I was like, I don't want to do it. I don't want to do it. Pull it. Let's not do this. Mind you, I've been doing this for seven years. And I was like, I don't think people are going to buy my arguments. I am not even sure if I buy all of my arguments. So when we talk about intersectionality, we understand that intersectionality, it's like it, with these interlocking identities, right? That interlocking variables. So if we think about like, the matrix of domination, we think about race, class, and gender in that matrix, right? I also think we think about like singlehood. It is important to offer an intersectional perspective when we talk about singlehood. You can't get away from that. That, that argument is easy to make. The other argument that I think I might get a little pushback about is I'm arguing that when we think of the matrix of domination, it should be race, class, gender, and singleism. Now, I am not suggesting that singleism is as oppressive as racism, but what I am suggesting is that racism permeates every social institution. I would argue that singleism permeates every social institution as well. So we need to think about the matrix of domination being race, class, gender, singleism. I'm not sure if y'all buy that. And you know, to be honest, sometimes I'm not buying my argument because I think what people could say is they're like, well, when do we stop the list? How long does, how far does the list go on? Does it just become the oppression Olympics? And I'm like, if we need to add as many variables to the list that we need to add, then so be it. But I think to just be short-sighted and leave it only at like race, class, and gender, I think that's very short-sighted. So that's why I sometimes buy my argument, sometimes I don't buy my argument. Respectability politics. So this is this kind of notion the, the, that um, Black folks need to conform to a certain kind of manner to fit in with um, mainstream white America and or to um, prevent being discriminated against. So in some ways, do we see singles being this kind of idea of disrespectability politics, not fit into what is considered the norm, and the norm being this heteronormative married couple household. So that's kind of the theoretical framework. Let me tell you the five objectives what the book is really trying to talk about. I'm trying to talk about the definition of the Black middle class. I really want to know if the Love Jones cohort uses objective or subjective measures, but I also want to know how they think about their family structure in their definition of middle class. I'm really fascinated about wealth accumulation and wealth dissemination, especially because they don't have any children and they're not married. So when do they decide to buy wealth, I mean, to buy things, uh, assets, and how do they think about disseminating their assets? And in that chapter, I talk a lot about um, how um, the Love Jones cohort are going to disseminate their wealth to their nieces, to their nephews, to their godchildren. And I'm really excited because I've had conversations with institutions outside of the academic, the academic setting who are trying to figure out how they can do um, some kind of estate planning for people that are single and living alone or in the Love Jones cohort. I also want to talk about neighborhood choices because I don't want to, <laughs> I decided, uh, there's many things I could have highlighted today, but I decided to highlight neighborhood choices. I'll tell you at the end, ask me at the end why I decided to highlight neighborhood choices. And then I want to talk a little bit about dating practices in the book. And let, let me be really honest. Oh, and I also want to talk about mental and physical health. Let me be really, really honest. I did not want to write a book and have a dating chapter in there. Why? Because I was like, I wanted to talk about more than just the, I wanted to talk more than just, I wanted to talk more than just about their dating practices of the Love Jones cohort. I want to talk about the lifestyles that they were living, the things that they were doing. If we have these chapters in here talking about why aren't you married? It becomes this kind of deficit model. In the end of the book, I say in the afterward, I say, after you read, read this book, I hope you're just as likely to ask somebody why they're married as you ask somebody, why are you single? We often ask single folks why they're single, but we don't ask married folks why they're married and wait for a coherent response. Because just to say, oh, I love them, that's not going to get me where I want to go. Single people have to always articulate theirs, but married folks don't have to do that. So I did want to put a dating chapter. But my, my publisher, my, my mentor, my, the reviewers, like you can't have a book about single and living alone without having some kind of like dating chapter in there. But some of the other things are really kind of interesting to me. And I wanted to talk about like their mental and physical health and how they cope with being single. So let's talk a little bit about the data that I collected. I collected data June and um, August 2015. The reason why the book took me seven years, I'm not making excuses per se, but the same year that I started, so for, for the graduate students, it shouldn't take you seven years, but if it does, you can get it done. But in 2015 is the same year that I started doing implicit bias training with police officers. 
And so I did not, it was hard to have the bandwidth to come home and try to write on a book about singles when I spent a whole day with police officers. Now, although it was just a whole day or it was one day, I was uh, I was nervous the day before. I always, in my mind, I'm like, should have said this, should have said that the day of. And the day after, I just want to stay in bed and just be in a beautiful position. But now I got to be a professor. I got to write this book. So it was really challenging to get it done. I, I quit the police department December 8th last month, last year. And the book came out this this month. So I don't have the arbitrage of police around my book, I, around my neck. I don't have the arbitrage of writing a book around my neck. So when I tell you I'm living my best life right now, I am absolutely living my best my best life right now. So we recruited in the DMV. We tried to, um, we recruited in the DMV. We tried to recruit for older folks. We wanted to make sure that we had older folks in the population um, in the sample, but that didn't really pan out as well as we wanted it to. We also recruited people in the LGBTQIA plus community, um, but that didn't pan out as well as we wanted to. The time for the interviews lasted about, uh, the average time was about an hour. There were some people that didn't have a lot to say. They gave no and yes answers, and that was 37 minutes. For the slowest interview, the longest interview was almost three hours. Um, we did decide, well, location. They could decide where they wanted the interview. Most people came to the University of Maryland campus. We also went to their homes and blah, 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 blah. Compensation. We gave them about $15 to do the, um, to do the interview. Snowball sampling. Interesting story. So we had, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to use poetic license on this one. We had one interviewer, one person that we interviewed, who was adopted by a Black family, went to historical Black college and universities, so Black, that was a man dated black women, but he actually was Korean. So we had to decide whether or not we were going to include him in the conversation, asking the asking Q and A, whether or not we decided to include him. And then if we decided to exclude him, we did a snowball sampling. So we asked people to give us five of the people that fit into the demographic. So if we exclude him, do we also exclude the other five people? Is it the fruit from the poisonous tree? We had a big debate in our research team about that. Parody, we had men interview men and we had women interview women. And um, we didn't have any uh, non-binary people that were actually in the sample. So we, did, we settled on 62 respondents. We had 74, but we had to decrease, we had to uh, delete some or exclude some. So for example, we wanted people who had never been married, never exposed to the stimuli, right? So 45 minutes into the interview, like, well, I was married for five years. That person's dead to me, so they don't exist. I'm like, that's not how that works. That's not how any of this works. Or they said... I have children, but they're money grubbing leeches. So the time that they're 18, I'm not giving them anything. The reason why we want people didn't weren't married, didn't have children is because you get to decide that you don't want to give this to your children. I wanted people who didn't have husbands, didn't have wives, didn't have partners, didn't have children. How are they thinking about disseminating their wealth? So they were self-defined as middle class. So all of them are never married with children. There's one person who was married for like six weeks. I think we, we included them. They had no children. And most of them have over $100,000 worth of wealth. And a lot of that was caught up in their... Um, their uh, home. So again, I wanted to think about like neighborhood choices. I wanted to think about like where they choose to live and how their solid status plays into the choosing where choosing to live where they want to live. And so we asked what factors led you to live into your live in your neighborhood and um, how important was it to you for you to live in this neighborhood based on your solid status. So there are two things that emerged that were quite interesting. And I, I like I said, we had 43 women and 19 men. So I also had to decide whether or not I wanted to write this book about Black women. And I grappled with that because women dominate the category. Women deserve a book in and of themselves. But I also thought that we might pick up some gender differences. It'd be really good to include the um, 19 minutes into the, into the book. And I'm glad that I did. So I'll give you an example here of how the gender difference kind of played out. So two things that emerged with safety and also neighborhood interactions. So here's one of our respondents. This is Deborah. She likes to travel to new places. She likes to cook. She works for her alma mater and is previously employed in the nation's capital. When Deborah was thinking about where to live, she was saying, because I want to live in a neighborhood where I feel safe, where I can come home at night, be, you're by yourself, so there's no one to come and rescue you. So safety was an important issue for Deborah. So Deborah's clearly talking about her solid status plays into her decision on where she's actually going to live. Joseph, who is a 31-year-old software specialist who resides in the East Coast, enjoys researching new information about his on his spare time and enjoys through either books or computers. Joseph said, I work on computers. So that's a big thing. I want to be sure that my equipment's safe. My unit is good. I have a locked door in the front. So safety is something I can check off. So what I was, in, was interesting and I talk about in the book was I use these as an example, but it was consistently showed up. Women were concerned about their physical safety. Men were concerned about their material safety. Had I not written the book, that may not have, if I, 
Well, I haven't the book, it wouldn't come up. But if I have in the book and include men in the conversation, that little gender nuance wouldn't have possibly shown up. What's also interesting is like where they're choosing to live. 50%, nearly 50% lived in family oriented neighborhoods. So I think it's really interesting. So when we think of salas, we think of them maybe possibly wanting to live in like cities where they can have like a nice nightlife and so on and so forth. But they chose to live in these like kind of like family oriented or suburban kind of areas. And 62% never or rarely interacted with their neighbors. And I dropped them two examples, I think, for this one. One is Alexis, who's 31 and is a human resource manager and has been work, worked her way up from being an intern. Her favorite hobbies include running and or traveling. So Alexis had a dog, and a dog, the dog, a dog came up with animals and pets came up a couple times in the um, interviews. So Alexis mentioned slightly more regular interaction with neighbors, but she conceded that's probably a byproduct of her having a dog. If she didn't have a dog, she probably wouldn't interact with the neighbors too much. So I have a dog who's like my child, and this is a really big dog community. They know his name before they even know my name. Like, oh, you're Encino's mom. It's like, yeah, yeah, that's my social life right here, walking my dog. So the interaction was tangential, and the interaction really had more to do with like the dog than actually just having uh, any kind of relationship with neighbors. It's funny. Oh, wait. It's, I didn't put it in. It's funny because there was a, a guy named Lafayette. These are all synonyms. And Lafayette said that um, he tried to speak to all of his neighbors. He lived in a cold attack. And he tried to speak to all of his neighbors because he's never been married. He doesn't have any children. He's a big black guy. And he's probably thought of it like the creepy dude at the end of the block. And so he tried to speak to all the neighbors, at least say hi. But when we think about like stigma, stigma is something that came up over and over again in the book. So much so that it was really hard for me as a scholar to actually parse out like who's more stigmatized, younger folks versus older folks. But one of the things that is consistent or men versus women, one of the things that is consistent is that you are stigmatized. Uh, the cohort thought that they were stigmatized when you were single and um, living alone. So that get made at a point to try to talk to people so he wouldn't be that really weird guy or possibly that, that gay guy who's never been married, doesn't have any children, is in the closet. So what are some of the broad conclusions just about the neighborhood come, the neighborhood chapter? So John Iceland and I did a paper back in 2011 um, for cities and communities. We looked at different household types and their segregation patterns. And one of the things we found in that paper, and I think it's kind of to some degree also illustrated here in the book, is that Sala households are less segregated from married couple households. They're more segregated from Sala households and most segregated from white married couple households. So I think that solos are living in different kinds of spaces and we need we need more research and understanding about where solos are actually living. It's great demographic work that's been done there and I've done quantitative work, but it's really great to kind of like put some metaphorical meat on the numeric bones that I've developed over the years. And that's what the book really does try to do. Generally, the cohort are really unconcerned with um, what their neighbors are thinking about them. And that kind of gets back to that notion I was talking about, about respectability politics. And it seems as if people's single status does play a role into where they choose to live and how they choose to navigate with their community. Now, that's just the conclusions for the neighborhood chapter. I put it in there for Kate, and please ask Kate why I put it in there for her. But there's broader conclusions that I want to draw from the book. First one, like I said before, I think it's really important that we don't lose sight of the fact that Black women, in some ways, have been doing singlehood for quite some time. They're the trailblazers. They're the pathfinders, they're the pioneers that have really shown how to do single uh, in an effective and efficient kind of way. And I think that, that they're the ones that are really spearheading this rise in singlehood or teaching people how to do it in America in particular. We had a really great conversation in the book about whether or not it's choice or circumstance or both and people that are single and living alone. There are a lot of people that mentioned that they were single and they were single by choice, but then they also talked about how previous circumstances influenced them deciding to be single. Also, getting back to the point that I was making earlier, we have to understand how structural forces constrain personal choices. I was on a, I was on a podcast the other day. And so I was saying, I said, you know, we have to make this more of a structural conversation versus an individual conversation. So I was like, you're often telling Black women that they need to change their standards. They need to have interracially married. That's, I'm drawing from um, Richard Banks' work, it was white, is marriage for white people. So if they have Black women need to interracially marry, all this kind of stuff. And I'm like, well, that's one way to possibly think about changing marriage rates. If we're talking about from a structural perspective, maybe not, maybe not, maybe not the most popular thing to say, but how about you pay black folks reparations? If you pay black folks reparations, give us access to capital, you might see a change in marriage rates. But don't make it, don't, don't put the onus solely on black Americans that they need to make some changes. We need to think about it from a structural perspective if structure got us here in the first place. The last thing, which we had a great, we had a great conversation about this last night. I am arguing that we need to think about how we define family and whether or not you can be a family of one. If we use a Census Bureau definition of a family, 
A family is someone that we're related to by blood, marriage, or adoption. So I don't show up as a family. I am considered a household. But if you buy my argument that structural forces constrain personal choices, and then you're discriminating against me because I'm not a family, then it's highly problematic. Let me give you three ways I think that you're discriminating. And we, Brandon and I, might, Brandon may not agree with me, but we're going to talk about it anyway. If I want to go to Verizon and get the family cell phone plan, I want to be able to pay my family cell phone plan for only one, one, one cell phone. If I want to go on vacation, a single occupancy is going to cost me more than a double occupancy. More egregious example, the tax structure. The tax structure advantages in some married household types, and in some ways, it can really disadvantage people that are single and living alone. Dorothy Brown wrote a really great book called The Whiteness of Wealth. One of the things she argues in her book is that we should all file a single. If we can't get to a place where we all file a single, I should be able to file as the Marsh family and get the benefits of the Marsh family. Although I do not have partner, I do not have a partner, and I do not have children, I do have a lot of responsibilities and obligations to my extended family. One of the things that the cohort talks about, and I'm drawing from the Washington Post and Hydra study that was done years ago, the checkbook for Salas, especially in the Black, in the black middle class in the book, the checkbook for the single and living alone households becomes like the community checkbook. So because you don't have a partner, you don't have children, it's like, it's okay, Chris Marsh doesn't have to eat, doesn't, doesn't eat tonight. But we want to make sure that we understand that just because I'm single and living alone does not mean that my checkbook should become a family checkbook. Cohort members talk about that over and over again. Besides just checkbook, they also talked about time. Like, like some people have to take like the grandmother to, to the podiatrist because they don't have a partner, don't have children. We have more flexible time. I think we need to reimagine the way in which we think about family. I think that because you are a family of one, you should because you are a one person household, you should be considered a family. I did a presentation in the Census Bureau. They were like, yeah, maybe we need to think about that. Because if you don't, structural forces constrain personal situations, and then you're discriminating in plain sight when you use antiquated definitions of family. I also think if we don't use this definition of family of one or the solid family plan, I do think we should think about augmented families. One of the things that was really clear in the book, when you read it, the Love Jones cohort talked a lot about how families, friends played an essential role in their lifestyle. So drawing from Andrew Billingsley's work, who was, who was writing, I think, in the 70s, he talked about these augmented families. And if we don't have a family of one, I think two non-romantic partners should be able to develop an augmented family and get some write-offs and some benefits within that augmented family. I talk about estate planning. I think you need to have some of these augmented families when you think about estate planning. So those are some of the broader kind of conclusions that the book is trying to make. I only have an hour, so I can't like delve deeply into them, but the book does a good job of that delving deeper into them. What I want to do is I want to end on a couple of different questions for you to think about, and then we'll open it up for questions. So, like I said, one of the things I want reviewer, I want um, readers to think about, I even want us to think about as scholars, is it lead us to ask the Love Jones cohort, why are you single and child free? If your question is based on the premise that having a spouse and children is the ultimate measure of success, then my answer is yes. Number two, is it demeaning to ask the Love Jones cohort, why are you single and child free? If in asking your question, the onus is placed solely at the boots of the cohort without consideration to structural forces and objective choices, then my answer is yes. Number three, is it insensitive to ask the Love Jones cohort, why are you single and child free? If, ask, if in asking a question, all other life accomplishments are ignored and it's assumed that their status is purely due to choice rather than out of necessity or circumstance, then my answer is a yes. Number four, is it discriminatory to ask the Love Jones cohort, why are you single and child free? If comparable questions are not asked of married folks, such as why are you married and have children, and or your question assumes that the dating practices and loves and sex lives of the cohort should be open to public consumption while the discussion of the marital bed is taboo, then my answer is a resounding yes. Number four, five, is it problematic to be uninformed of how structural forces shape individual behavior before asking a loved one's cohort why are you single and child free? If your question is based on the assumption that singleness is solely due to some form of personality deficit without any regard to structural impediments, then my answer is yes. And then lastly, the provoking attention between the black middle class to ask the Love Jones cohort, why are you married and single? Why are you single and child free? If the assumption underlying your question is that only a certain type of household type is acceptable when it comes to membership in the black middle class, then yes, my answer is a resounding yes. So that is all that I have. Here is my um, here is my my information. You can get in touch with me real quick. I'm about to take about the, the cover of the book. 
So if you look up there, that's the original cover that I wanted to have for the book. I am from Los Angeles. I had a boyfriend at the time. His mother, his grandmother died. I was in Chickamauga, Georgia. Never been there. And his grandmother died. We were cleaning up her house. And they told me, they assigned a closet to me. When I opened up the closet, the first thing I saw was an Ebony magazine that said the Black Middle Class, which is all of my scholarship. I was like, oh my God, this is my book cover whenever I write a book. It's, you can't see it, but it's also dated August 1973. If you remember at the beginning, I told you I give zero fucks. I'll be 50. I'll be 50 August this year. So I was born August 1973. Now, the problem, great story, right? Problem is, is that I had to get all of the copyright issues and stuff with, with Ebony. And that was going to take way too long. And I did not want to delay the book any further. So I settled on a, a cover, which is about a Black woman who used to do quilting in, DM, in the DMV, actually in Anacostia. And she would bring little black and brown children to her house and teach them how to quilt. So this is actually a quilt. People think it's a stained glass window for the church, but it's actually not. It's a quilt. But because family, friends and family play, play an essential role in the lifestyles of those that are single and living alone, I decided to make this the cover of the book. And here's all my information. You can get in touch with me. And that is all that I have.